Good evening. Tonight we go after a fantastic story. The story that flying saucers from other worlds are visiting our planet just as we are exploring outer space with our own rocket satellites. Our guest is former Marine Air Corps Major Donald Kehoe, who has the support of scores of prominent businessmen, military men, and some scientists in his campaign to prove that flying saucers exist. If you're curious to know why Major Kehoe charges that the United States Air Force is deliberately deluding us when it calls saucer stories the bunk, if you want to hear his own evidence that the saucers are real, and his reaction to the claim of two Americans who say they've spoken with men from Venus. We'll go after those stories in just a moment. My name is Mike Wallace. The cigarette is Parliament. The new high filtration filter, Parliament, presents... Mike Wallace interview. We'll meet Major Kehoe in just a minute. How does your cigarette stack up against other brands? Well, if Parliament's your smoke, you're smoking the best because now Parliament with the recessed filter is best. That's the new high fi for high filtration Parliament. The proof? Well, suppose I show you. First, Parliament is best. Because only Parliament can give you over 30,000 traps. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. Second, unlike ordinary filters, Parliament's filter is recessed, set deep down inside here, so that trapped nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. And third, because it's recessed, there's no bitter taste of concentrated nicotine and tar to spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. These filter findings are confirmed by the United States Testing Company. Over 30,000 traps, exclusive recessed filter, flavor pure protection. Yes, now smoke the best. High filtration, Parliament, now at popular price. And now to our story. Major Donald Kehoe is the director of the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomena. As head of this private group interested in flying saucers, He's repeatedly attacked the United States Air Force and others for claiming that flying saucers are apparently flights of fancy and not flights by Martians or men from the moon. Independent surveys show that millions of Americans do share his belief in these celestial saucers. Major Kehoe, first of all, let me ask you this. Most people in the United States, in spite of the fact that I say that millions do believe, I think you will agree that most people in the United States don't believe in flying saucers from outer space. They probably hold the view of columnist Bob Considine, who wrote that flying saucers are products of, for the most part, quote, pranksters, halfwits, cranks, publicity hounds, fanatics in general, and screwballs, end quote. How do you feel about Mr. Considine's charge? Well, I know where he got the story. He got it from Colonel Watson out at the Air Technical Intelligence Center in Dayton. In fact, the colonel went even a little farther, and he said behind every sighting was an idiot, a crackpot, a religious fanatic. That included a lot of high-ranking Air Force pilots, incidentally, mm -hmm. and many airline captains, people who were qualified to see these things. You but see. he was just following out an Air Force policy. Well, now, you're not suggesting that Bob Considine is in the pay of the Air Force. He's an no, independent I mean newsman with a considerable reputation. I mean the colonel. No, I have uh -oh. every respect for Bob Considine. In spite of the fact that he <clears throat> suggests that pranks, pranksters, half-wits, and screwballs are responsible for the stories about flying saucers. Well, I wish I could show him at uh, any time a list of about 800 witnesses, some of the big names in aviation, including up to the rank of colonel in the Air Force. Mm -hmm. They're still flying, and they're still carrying passengers. They've never been grounded. They're still guiding airliners in, the radar men are, night after night in bad weather. If they're screwballs and incompetence, why are they still on the job? Major Kehoe, where do you think flying saucers are coming from? I don't know. The, there is an indication that they could be using Mars as a base. I don't mean they originate there, but every time Mars has approached us in the last... Ten years, there's been a noticeable increase in, in saucer sightings. Mm -hmm. And that's been mentioned officially. In fact, the Canadian official project, uh, on the basis of that, set up an observation station in Canada. 
You say the Canadian official project. Uh, what, what do you mean by the official? There was an official project called Project Magnet. And they set up an observatory at Shirley Bay mm -hmm. to try to track these things. And uh, What happened to the official project? You say there was a project. Yes, they, they ran for about a year, and they had one sighting uh, on a gravimeter, which indicated that something, a very large object, had flown over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, they finally decided they were spending a little too much money on it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly they wouldn't have thought that they were spending too much money on it if they believed that that kind of phenomena existed. A lot of people on the project are still working up there on their own time, and uh, certain government officials have still uh, kept the lid on their reports in Canada, just as they do down here. What is your theory? In other words, you suggest that they come from Mars or from other planets, from uh, other solar systems, possibly, throughout the universe. Is that correct? Yes, and there are a lot of scientists who said the same thing. What is your theory as to the kind of people who fly these, or the kind of beings who, who fly these saucers? Well, that's speculation. Willie Lay said recently they'd be just like the man next door, the invaders from space, and his reasons may be good. But most of the uh, top scientists have said that the odds are that uh, beings from other worlds would not be like us. Some of them would be. Uh, Dr. Harlow Shapley, for instance, said that there probably were at least 100 million inhabited planets in the universe. And uh, Menzel, who doesn't believe in saucers at all, says that he goes that high or even higher. And among those, by they must be, by the law of averages, a certain number of planets that would be like the Earth. Mm -hmm. And if evolution started at the same time, why, you might have the same type of being. What do you think are the intentions of these people, for lack of a better name, of these people and who are in these flying saucers? Well, there's been no evidence of any hostility. Uh, during the last uh, ten years, what we call the modern phase, there have been sightings before then. There have been some accidents, Air Force pilots chasing these things. Captain Mantell was killed chasing one in 48, and uh, two pilots disappeared chasing one in 53 over Lake Superior. But uh, I think those were just accidents. Just accidents. Why don't they try to communicate with us? What's your theory about that? Well, I'll follow some of the uh, theories the Air Force people have said. Suggest they suggested to me back in 52 and 53, at which time... Uh, we were cooperating. Uh, we, I had a lot of very good friends in the Air Force at that time. The policy was to give out the information. They were about to tell the people everything they had. And the theory was then that perhaps these beings were so much different from us that uh, communication would be a very hard thing. They might not, for instance, have speech sounds like ours. Mm -hmm. That's one answer. Another thing, they might not be able to exist in our atmosphere. Uh, we're going to land on the moon, we'll have to wear spacesuits or else uh, build uh, air-conditioned buildings up there, air pressured. Uh, there could be lots of factors like that. Well, do you think they're down here when we do see them to look at us? I think that it's probably a long-range survey. A long-range survey. That's but, right. And yet no attempt, as far as we know in any case, of communication with us. There have been claims of uh, communication, but those, most of those have been by individuals. The Air Force has not uh, admitted that there's ever been one, mm -hmm. and I don't know, our committee hasn't found any cases that we would accept as absolutely verified. All right, now, let's go at it from another point of view, if I may, the Air Force point of view. They agree, undoubtedly, objects have been seen in the sky. But the Air Force has said time and time again, and this is a quote from Richard Horner, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Research and Development, all but a small percentage of these reports of unidentified flying objects have been definitely attributed to natural phenomena that are neither mysterious nor dire, end quote. Weather balloons, mirages, ordinary sky phenomena like meteors, uh, airplanes themselves. What about that? I'll answer that, but I'd like to make several points doing it. In 1947, the Air Technical Intelligence Center at Dayton, it's the top Air Force intelligence men, and scientists under contract sent a secret document to the commanding general of the Air Force saying that whatever these things were, they were real. In 1948, ATIC, the same group, mm -hmm. sent a top secret estimate to the commanding general, Hoyt Vandenberg, said these were interplanetary spaceships. Mm -hmm. In 1952, there was an intelligence analysis of the maneuvers of these things, as seen by radar, triangulation, radar photo uh, photographs, and in 53, the Central Intelligence Agency and the Air Force had a special panel of scientists meet at the Pentagon. 
to tell him what to do. And after they got through, this group said, you don't have proof that these things exist, not scientific proof, but you have a very strong circumstantial case. We suggest you quadruple the investigation, set up special observation posts, and in the meantime, release everything you've got to the American people. Now, you've got four documents there that, that they've been sitting on all this time. Now, that, and they have been spending a lot of money investigating flying saucers. If they don't exist, why the money? Why did the intelligence teams rush out every time there's a sighting? Now then, you have mentioned four documents that you claim exist. We've heard in the past that you have claimed that these documents existed. We've seen your literature in which you talk about the existence of those documents. So we spoke with the Air Technical Intelligence <coughs> Center at the Pentagon earlier this week, and this is what we were told officially by them. Three of the four documents Major Kehoe refers to simply do not exist. The fourth document does exist. You can have a copy of it, Mr. Wallace, and you can see that it doesn't say what Major Kehoe claims it says. We have a copy of it, and I quote to you from the copy. The Air Force document says just this. The panel recommends that the National Security Agencies take immediate steps to strip the UFOs of the special status they have been given and the aura of mystery they have unfortunately acquired. We suggest an integrated program designed to reassure the public of the total lack of evidence of inimical forces behind the phenomena. And again, as I point out, Secretary Horner says, it simply ain't so. Now why, <clears throat> the, point, the, the point really at issue here would seem, Major Kehoe, is this. Why do you believe that the Air Force says that nothing is going on? Why do you believe that the, it's a fairly serious charge that I you know make. it is. You make the charge that the United States government is withholding from the people of the United States certain very important information. Why? What would their motive be for withholding <coughs> that kind of information from us? Well, I'll answer that, but I would also like to show you some proof that they are withholding it. The reason that was given to me when they were working with me back in 52 and 53 was, first, that they were afraid of hysteria. Remember the Orson Welles show back way years back when he scared people into the hills with the idea of invading Martians? Then... Uh, they were also afraid that it would upset uh, organized religion. That was a smaller factor, but there was some fear of it. Later, they were afraid that these accidents, when interceptors had chased these things and had been lost or had crashed, might be considered a proof of hostility. Now, I would never have put my name on anything if it were a matter of personal opinion. I've talked to and read the reports of hundreds of pilots and radar men and guided missile trackers who've seen these things, and some of them are very important names. Uh, the Air Force says they have does this down to 1.9 percent, but you'll notice the word current in there. They mean we are currently explaining. Now, I have in my possession a copy of Special Report 14, which is their Bible on this. In the back, it has a table showing that 3,201 3, cases they examined, 19.5 percent were unsolved and they admit they still are unsolved. You add up what they've had since then, it makes over 12% of the reports, and those are mostly from the best possible sources. Well, now, wait just a second. I'll mm -hmm. use your figures. The Department of Defense released an official bulletin of, on November 5, 1957, saying that from June of 55 to June of, uh, of 57, a two-year period, just a fraction over 2% of all investigated <clears throat> unidentified flying objects had to be listed as unknown. 2%. So that's your 1.9. What was the period again? 55 to 57. The rest were determined to have been balloons, airplanes, hoaxes, and a category about 12% called insufficient information, which means that the report was so flimsy that there was simply nothing to check on. I must confess that they have, they've certainly shown me no classified material, but they have opened their files quite willingly to us in our preparation for this program tonight. And they've given us very convincing evidence, mm -hmm. Major Kehoe, that it is... <clears throat> largely, I shouldn't say largely, I'll say 99 and 44 one hundredths percent, a hoax. Now, you mentioned... A hoax? Well, let, let, uh, when I say a, a hoax... a lot of good pilots hoaxers, then. No, 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 not hoaxers. I, I thank you for correcting me. Not just a hoax, but let's say misinformation or sightings of objects which seem to be one thing but are, in fact, another. Uh, I'm glad that you corrected me about hoax because it was by no means that much a hoax. 
But you mentioned a Dr. Donald Menzel, who's a professor of astrophysics mm -hmm. at Harvard before. Now, I think you will agree that he's one of the world's most distinguished astrophysicists. Is that not so? I think there are others who are equally capable but who do not agree with him. He is, one of the, he is one of the world's most distinguished astrophysicists, though I think we can agree on that. In any case, he stresses, you see, that pilots are not expert observers, mm. that they, as well as others, can see flying saucers when it's only, to quote him, the wrapper off somebody's lunch blowing around in the air, end quote. Uh, but again, let's come back to the point the most important point, Major Kehoe, and that is why, why will the Air Force, why will the United States government withhold information from United States citizens? For what reason? Because they're treating them like children, the way they did with the H-bomb at first, and the way they were doing with, they've been doing with other things. Now, I'm not attacking the United States Air Force. I'm attacking a small group in there that has been persistently keeping this from the, from the public, just as they've kept other things. For a long time, you couldn't even mention the idea that we could be hit by missiles from submarines from the Gulf and from both coasts very easily. I knew that years and years ago and tried to get it out, and at the time was discouraged about it. Now, I'm, you mentioned these, did this denial of these documents. Now, I'd like to tell you something that happened on the Armstrong Circle Theater. I had requested that those points be in the script, and I was discouraged from it at first by their writer. Then later, some of our Board of Governors insisted that we have those points included. So I said, either I don't go on or we have those in there. So I said, all right. So the script was completely rewritten. Now, those were in the script as it was first rehearsed. But when the second rehearsal came along, and the Air Force saw the mimeograph sheet, the Air Force representative, according to the Armstrong writer, said they would immediately deny it on the air, even though it meant denouncing their own former project chief. Now, the source for this was Captain Edward Ruppelt, who was the head of Project Blue Book for two years. And at that time, he was considered good enough that he briefed President Truman on these things. Mm -hmm. He was the top man. Rank didn't mean anything. It's your experience that counted. All right. He says these things existed. He put it in the book, which was cleared by security and review in the Air Force. On December 5, 1955, that was cleared. It's in his book. He's never been hauled in and court-martialed. Now, I have here, and if you allow your camera to come in on it, mm -hmm. this is a sheet from the script of the Armstrong Theater, which was deleted. This was crossed off, and I was told that I couldn't say it on the air. Mm -hmm. Now, that was censorship by intimidation. This can be matched up with the other sheets from the Armstrong Circle script, and any typewriter expert will show you. Well, I'm certain, that, I'm certain that... They ordered it taken out. I'm certain that people believe you. The only thing is that the next morning, I distinctly remember reading a report by you, Major Keogh, to the effect that no censorship, no pressure of any kind had been put <laughs> no, on you. I, I'm sorry, Mr. Walsh, that I know that statement almost by heart. Yes. I said that CBS and the Armstrong uh, people were not to blame for cutting me off the air when I tried to mention the fact that a Senate committee was working on the secrecy angle. I never mentioned this that night to anyone, because I had promised that I wouldn't say anything about it on the air, that, uh, the, the Armstrong people. It was taken out, and I will do this. I will ask the United States Air Force to have the Marine Corps put me on active duty for court-martial, if that is not the case. Major Kehoe, I understand you have three new reports on file, which, in your opinion, you have them currently on file, and they're new reports. And these, in your opinion, would convince every person in this country that flying saucers are a fact. Is that correct? They should convince a lot of people because of the, the names involved. Tell us about it. I told your uh, interviewer in Washington that I couldn't mention the names because they were too high. One of them is a top scientist in this country whose name would be known to everybody. Well, why wouldn't he want his... Because he's afraid of the official ridicule. He's afraid of official ridicule? That's right. More afraid of official ridicule than of possibly uh, alerting the country to a serious You'd national danger? You'd be surprised danger? how many people give us reports, and they say, please keep my name confidential. Well, I'll give you one report which came to us. The name has to be left out. In 1951, a UFO circled the fleet in Korean waters. It circled it at high speed, and they launched several planes to try to get a close in on it. They got a radar lock on. That is, the radar was guiding the planes toward the object. Mm -hmm. This was picked up by radars on 14 naval vessels. 
This object circled about uh, oh, for a half an hour or more, and then it took off at a speed way over in excess of 1,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. This report was certified, and uh, nine members of our Board of Governors saw it, signed it, and agreed that it, they had seen it, and agreed to the contents. Yeah. Uh, there is another report that just came in from four top missile designers or engineers at one of the big plants in this country. They saw an elliptically shaped object and two small round disc-shaped objects fl flying with it over California, November 11th, 1957, at a speed of at least 5,000 miles an hour. These men are well qualified to know what they see with broad daylight, not a cloud in the sky. There have been cases even where the Air Force has shot at these things. Now, if there's nothing there and they don't exist, uh, why do they shoot at them? You mentioned Mr. Horner. The day after Mr. Horner said that the Air Force was not concealing anything, a Captain Gregory Oldenburg, a public information officer at Langley Field, refused to let an ad be inserted in the Langley Base Flyer, their newspaper, which asked that anybody interested in UFOs please communicate and form a little group. He said, I must refuse to do this because this, the dissemination of information on UFOs is contrary to Air Force policy and Air Force Regulation 200-2. And I have a copy of it here in case you want to see it. Well, Major Kehoe, I must say that the Air Force tells us they don't question your motives, but they do question the accuracy of a good deal of your information, and for that reason they say you ha have been, and were they to, in a sense, uh, throw open an invitation to all people who cite UFOs to get in touch with them once again. They get all kinds of cranks, hoaxers, and so forth, and you see they run down every one of these sightings, and it has cost them a tremendous amount of money to no avail over the past few years. That's what they told you. That is what they told me. Now, sir, in a moment I'd like to ask you this. In the past few years, millions of flying saucer enthusiasts have become excited about the stories of two men, George Adamski and Howard Menger. Both of them claim to have seen flying saucers. Mm -hmm. Menger claims to have been given a ride in one by some creatures from Venus. Adamski says he's chatted with a man from Venus in the California desert. I'd like to get your reaction to those stories, and we'll get Major Kehoe's reaction in just 60 seconds. The first filter cigarette in the world that meets the standards of the United States Testing Company. Parliament, with a new high filtration filter. Here are the facts. And this is the cigarette. Parliament proved in Parliament over 30,000 traps. The most effective filtering material in a cigarette today. No other popular cigarette delivers less tar and nicotine. Proved in Parliament. The exclusive recessed filter holds trapped tar and nicotine away from your lips. There's no leakage from filter to mouth. Proved in Parliament. The most complete filtering action in cigarette history. And the flavor story is simple. More expensive tobaccos bring you the friendly satisfaction that cigarettes were invented for. All filtering findings you have seen and heard are certified true by the world's leading independent research laboratories. Parliament, now for the first time at popular price. Why don't you try Parliament yourself? All right, Major, about George Adamski and Howard Menger, both men claim to have talked with men from Venus. Menger claims that he's even taken a ride on a flying saucer. Do you believe him? No. You think they are hoaxers? We do not accept any reports of these so-called contactees without more evidence. We've asked them to submit their claims and take lie detector tests. We don't throw them out. We simply say we'll give you a fair chance. I think that's the least important part of the picture. The most important part is the weight of evidence from hundreds of competent people. And I'd like to name a few. Captain Richard Case, American Airlines. Captain C.S. Childs, Eastern Airlines. Captain T. Kravitz, TWA. Robert Adickus, TWA. Colonel Donald J. Blakesley, U.S. Air Force, a wing commander. Mm -hmm. I could go down the list. Uh, people who know what they're doing, and they're still on duty, they're still flying. Major Kehoe, what would you like to see done about flying saucers that is not currently being done? What steps would you like to see taken? I think the American people should write to their congressmen and insist that open hearings be held by the Senate Committee on Permanent Gov on the Permanent Committee on Government Operations, which has been looking into this for six months. An Air Force I spokesman told us this last week, he said, members of the, Sen of the Senate subcommittee have talked with us already, and they have shown no interest in conducting any hearings on this issue. 
I talked with the chief investigator within the last two weeks. I gave him a lot of information, and I gave him data on one case where an airliner was sent to chase one of these things, and, they, and the passengers kept in ignorance of it at that time. That involves two government agencies beside the Air Force, which has re refused to release the report. Mm -hmm. And I'll say this. If you were to get, if, they, if the committee were to get Rupert, Major Fournay, several colonels were on that time, Major General Garland, who was on the project, it would be a big revelation because the Air Force is simply treating the American people like children. They don't trust them with the facts. You know, here is an interesting, I think, an interesting question, Major. The United States and Russia have started sending satellites into the sky, and we may be hitting the moon with a rocket <clears throat> soon, possibly Mars. You believe that creatures from outer space have space stations on Mars. What's going to happen when we start firing rockets at the moon or at Mars? That question's already been brought up. Uh, we expect to have a base on the moon within the next five years. Uh, it's possible that there is a base on there. I don't say there was any proof of it. Is I'd it possible we're going to start an interplanetary <laughs> war when we start sending our rockets to the moon and to Mars? In 1935, General Douglas MacArthur said the next war would be an interplanetary war and we'd have to be unite against people from other planets. One uh, last question, Major Kehoe. Have you ever seen a flying saucer? I've seen them tracked on radar. But I take the word of about 800 of the best witnesses in this country and abroad. But you yourself have never seen a flying saucer. I've just been a reporter and a careful one. Thank you very much, Major Donald Kehoe. As you've just heard, the flying saucer controversy is deadlocked in contradictory statements and interpretation of facts. As for Major Donald Kehoe himself, like most of us, he's never seen a flying saucer, which may just make him like a mystic who's never seen a ghost. But one must give him credit. He has much faith. In a moment, I'll bring you a rundown on next week's guest, one of the giants of the entertainment business. Tonight, this very minute, right now, Parliament with the recessed filter is best. Best in everything that counts. And here's why. First, over 30,000 traps in this filter. No other popular cigarette delivers less nicotine and tar. The second, unlike every other filter, Parliament's filter is recessed. It's set deep down inside here so that trapped nicotine and tar can't get on your lips. And third, because it's recessed, there's no bitter taste of concentrated nicotine and tar to spoil Parliament's pure tobacco flavor. These filter findings are confirmed by the United States Testing Company. Smoke the best. High filtration, Parliament, now at popular price. Next week, we go after the story of a giant in show business. You see him behind me now. He's Oscar Hammerstein II, who's collaborated on some 40 musicals, including the Rodgers and Hammerstein classics, Oklahoma, Carousel, The King and I, and South Pacific, the last of which is soon to be released as a Hollywood film. If you're curious to hear Oscar Hammerstein talk about the changing face of show business, about the suggestion that his books and lyrics are naive and stickily sentimental, and if you want to hear Oscar Hammerstein discuss the controversial social and political beliefs that shape his stage work. We'll go after those stories next week. Till then, for Parliament, Mike Wallace reminding you to help keep the Red Cross on the job for us. Give generously. Good night. The Mike Wallace interview has been brought to you by the new High Filtration Parliament. Parliament, now for the first time at popular price. Sid Caesar as the German professor discusses child care with Imogene Coca tomorrow night. Don't miss the fun on ABC Television Network. <laughs>